Thomas Watson, the great Puritan who wrote uh, A Body of Divinity, died in his prayer closet. Spurgeon wrote the foreword to A Body of Divinity, and Spurgeon said Watson may not have even known that he died, that he just went from glory to glory, from the presence of the Lord to the presence of the Lord. And we need to live that way, do we not? We need to live quorum Deo in the face of God, in the presence of God, and live with all of our might. I invite you to take God's Word and turn with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1. In the worship guide, it says that I will be preaching on the gospel preaching of John the Baptist and then of Christ, but my heart feels pulled and drawn in a different direction, and so perhaps at next year's conference we may look at those verses. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You know, Spurgeon would go into his study on Saturday night not knowing what he was going to preach. And he said he would open the Bible and it was as if every verse in the Bible was saying, Preach me, preach me. <laughs> Put me in your Bible and take me to church. Let me show you the power that I can unleash on hearts. Well, I didn't pull this together last night. I'm not Spurgeon. Um, but I want us to look at this text and for us to think about the gospel preaching of the Apostle Paul. I want to begin by reading in our time this session and then this afternoon and the other session that I'll have with you. I want us to look at this, this opening to the epistle to the Romans. God's Word reads, beginning in verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for His name's sake among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest need that we have in the world today is for the gospel of Jesus Christ to do its work. Our greatest need is not political, neither is it financial. The greatest issue confronting us today is not fixing the economy. Neither is it creating jobs and reducing the unemployment problem. The greatest crisis that we face is not Iran getting the nuclear bomb. Neither is it international terrorism in Egypt or Afghanistan. The number one greatest need that we face in the world today is the spiritual problem of sinful souls of men and women. How can sinful man be made right with holy God? There is only one cure for the sin problem in the lives of people and that is the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The gospel alone can reconcile sinful man to holy God. The gospel alone can change a person's life from the inside out and make him or her a new creature in Christ Jesus. This is our greatest need. It is for the gospel to do its work. This is precisely what Paul is addressing in these opening letters, in these opening verses of Romans. The apostle is affirming to the church in Rome that the gospel is the only solution 
to the great need in the Roman Empire, and for that matter, around the world. Rome was the capital of the known world. Rome was the most important city in the entire empire. Rome boasted a population of over one million people. It boasted magnificent buildings such as Emperor's, the Emperor's Palace and Circus Maximus and the Forum. This is where Caesar lived and where Caesar presided and swung his imperial might. Here is where the most powerful marching army in the world was assembled. Rome was the seat of power for the known world, political power, military power, legislative power. Yet Paul had a far greater power for Rome than Rome had any idea of. He had the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul wanted to go to Rome and stand in the marketplace and put forth the gospel of Jesus Christ and confront every ideology and confront every philosophy that man had to offer and the gospel would blow those ideologies out of the water. The dominant theme in these opening verses is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The central thrust and overarching truth of this opening section as well as for the entire rest of the book is the gospel. You will note in these opening verses that in verse 1 Paul addresses the gospel of God. In verse 9 he refers to the gospel of His Son. In verse 15 Paul writes, I am eager to preach the gospel to you. And in verse 16 Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. This book is all about the gospel. Some 60 times, 60 times in this book, the word gospel is used. This epistle to the Romans is a showcasing of the most powerful message that has ever been heard upon planet earth, the most powerful message that has ever been spoken by human lips. And we find contained here in Rome, in the book of Romans, perhaps the most profound presentation of this powerful message. Martin Luther, the great German reformer, called the book of Romans, quote, the very purest gospel, close quote. And William Tyndale, mightily used of God to translate the Bible for us into the English language, said of Romans that it is, quote, the most pure, glad tidings that we call gospel. The book of Romans is all about this gospel. What I want to do is walk through these verses and set before us what we already know and remind us of our commitment to this powerful message. We need not have our heads down. We need not have our countenance lowered. We need to have such a holy boldness about us and such a confidence in our message that as we stand to preach and exposit the Word of God, we need, we need to be reminded that the message that we bring is the most dynamic, the most life-changing, the most, the most powerful message ever to be announced on planet Earth. I want you to note several headings with me as we begin to look at this text. I want you to note first the source of the gospel. That is found in verse 1. Paul begins by declaring from whence this gospel comes. Who is the author of this gospel? Who designed it? Who is the executor of this gospel? In verse 1 we read, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus. Paul is only the messenger. Paul is only the ambassador who has been dispatched from the sovereign throne of heaven above. 
Paul is simply the delivery boy. He is not the editor. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for, here it is, the gospel of God. The gospel of God does not mean in this text that it is a gospel about God. The gospel is about God. It is about God's love, God's grace, God's wrath poured out upon His Son upon Calvary's cross. It is about the character, the attributes, the saving enterprise of God. But in this case, this means the gospel from God. In other words, God is the source of this message. God is the origin of the gospel. God is the author. God is the architect. God is the originator. The gospel comes from the infinite genius mind of Almighty God and it comes pouring out of His great love for sinners. Leon Morris, who is a noted New Testament commentator, writes at this point, God is the most important word in this epistle. And by the way, we could say that of every book in the Bible. God is the most important word. This is God's gospel. James Montgomery Boyce writes, The gospel is God's gospel. It is something God announced and God accomplished. And and what He sent His apostles to proclaim. It is something God blesses. And through which God saves men and women. John Stott, the noted English expositor, asserts, The apostles did not invent it. It was revealed and entrusted to them by God. This is still the first and most basic conviction which underlies all authentic preaching. What we have to share with others is neither a miscellaneous uh, human speculations, nor one more religion to add to the rest, nor really a religion at all. It is rather the gospel of God, God's own good news for a lost world. Without this conviction, um, our preaching is devoid of conviction. This one true saving gospel that we preach, it is not conceived by any church. It is not the product of any denomination. It has not been scripted by any seminary. This gospel was birthed in the mind and in the heart and in the will of God in eternity past. This is God's saving message. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great English expositor from the last century, writes concerning that this is God's gospel. He says it is a great announcement of what God has done. It is God acting. God has spoken. And God has revealed a plan and a program. It is God's revelation, my friend, Lloyd-Jones says. It is not what man thinks. It is not what a man aspires after. It is not what a man proposes. It is entirely from God. It is God announcing His program and revealing it to men. The source of this one saving gospel, Paul says, is God. In Galatians 1 and verse 11, Paul will say, But I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by you is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of God. Later at the end of this opening section in Romans, in Romans 11 verse 36, Paul will say, From Him, and through Him, and to Him are all things. And Paul has an eye on the gospel. That the gospel is from God, it has been given to us through God, and its highest aim is for the glory and the exaltation of God. This gospel has been entrusted to you and to me. We may not tamper with it. We may not add to it. 
We may not hold back any feature of it. We are stewards who must give an account to our Master one day, full disclosure of the truth. This message has been put into our hands, and there should be within our heart a driving passion to preach and to teach and to proclaim this gospel. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. I didn't sign up for this, Paul is saying. God apprehended me on the road to Damascus. God laid hold of me, and God thrust this upon me. I am simply doing what sovereign God in heaven has enlisted me to do. And then he says, for woe is me. And that word woe means the greatest ministry. May the judgment of God be upon me. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Because of the source of the gospel, each one of us has the highest degree of direct accountability to the author of this gospel to be faithful stewards and preachers of this message. There is zero tolerance for tampering with God's gospel. It is so powerful, John Calvin said, whenever the gospel is preached, it is as if God Himself came into the midst of it. Calvin believed that there was a, an unusual manifestation of the power of God whenever His gospel is preached. Calvin again asserted, preaching is the public ex exposition of Scripture by the man sent from God in which God Himself is present in judgment and in grace. God is so identified with His gospel Spurgeon would go on to say that the heart and the mind of God has been set on His gospel from all eternity past, and God revels in the preaching of the gospel here upon the earth, for it has come from God and God alone. The question before us today is, will we preach this gospel as we have been commissioned by God to do? Will we preach it faithfully? Will we, re will we resist all temptation from the spirit of this age to deviate one iota from the pristine purity of this message? Number one, the source of the gospel. Number two, the exclusivity of the gospel. Would you please note verse 1 again? Paul a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Not a gospel, as though there are many gospels, as though there are many roads to heaven, uh, as though maybe there's a gospel for Jews, maybe a different gospel for Gentiles, Maybe there was a gospel for the Old Testament. Maybe a different gospel for the New Testament. No, there is only one gospel. And it is the only way of salvation. To refuse this gospel is to refuse the only means of grace. To reject this gospel is to remain under the wrath of God. Jesus Himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He has an exclusive monopoly on access to the Father and into the kingdom of heaven. Peter said before the Sanhedrin, there is salvation in no other name. I've done a word study on this. You know what it means? There is salvation in no other name. Listen, we're not just dogmatic about this, we're bulldogmatic about this. There is salvation in no other name. No one else ever hung upon a cross and bore my sins and carried them far away. No one else was ever laid in a grave and came up on the third day for my justification. 
No one else has ever been seated at the right hand of God the Father, and that one has all authority in heaven and earth. No one else, if we call upon that name, will He bestow saving grace. Paul says there is one God and one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus, who gave Himself a ransom for all, the testimony born at the proper time. No, this speaks to the exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so therefore, as we preach as expositors, we preach with authority, we preach with boldness, we preach knowing that this is the only way of salvation. The gospel of God. Verse 9 says, the gospel of His Son. Verse 15 says, I am eager to preach the gospel to you. Verse 16 says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Paul believed this so deeply in his soul that to the Galatians, he would write in Galatians 1 verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Anathema. Damned and go to hell before you bring others with you into the fiery pit below. Verse 9, as we have said before, so I say again now. In other words, if you didn't get it the first time, let me tell you this one more time, Paul says. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. This is why we must go and preach this one saving gospel. Because there is no other gospel. Romans 10, verse 14, Paul says, How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in Him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. This means we must go, we must advance, we must preach, we must proclaim, we must plead, we must urge, we must declare, we must announce, we must get on the housetops, we must proclaim this good message, we must go into the highways and into the byways because of the exclusivity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is not another way by which one may be saved. I want you to know the third, the promise of the gospel. In verse 2, we read that the gospel is not a new message that has only recently burst onto the scene in New Testament times. And the gospel is not a trendy message to appear in these last days. The gospel, rather, is rooted and grounded in antiquity. The gospel is rooted and grounded in the Old Testament Scripture. There is continuity from the Old Testament to the New Testament. There is only one way of salvation in both Old and New Testament. The New Testament gospel is the Old Testament gospel. It is salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. There is no other gospel. So look at verse 2. Verse 2 begins with the word which, an impersonal pronoun looking back to the antecedent, which is the gospel of God. The gospel of God, which he, referring to God, the author of this gospel, the architect of this gospel, which he promised. 
beforehand, meaning long ago, through His prophets in the Holy Spirit. God declared His gospel long ago at the dawn of civilization. The gospel was preached, this says, by the prophets. What was entrusted to Paul was announced to Adam and Eve. It was believed by Abraham. It was recorded by Moses. It was pictured in Levitical sacrifices and in the priestly system. It was proclaimed by the prophets. Uh, this gospel is not a newly conceived message. This gospel is not a new way of salvation. This gospel was declared from long ago. It is an ancient message. As we consider this ancient message, I want you to turn back, if you would, to the book of Genesis, to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. This is the first mention of the gospel. Theologians refer to it <clears throat> as the Proto-Euangelion, the first gospel. And we must understand the first gospel is the only gospel. In Genesis 3 and verse 15, <clears throat> we see recorded for us the first declaration of the gospel. And the preacher is the greatest preacher who ever has existed. It is God Himself who preaches this message. In Genesis 3 and verse 15, we read, The very words of God, after Adam and Eve have fallen, and God has pronounced His judgment in verse 14 upon the serpent, after the message of condemnation, now comes this message of salvation. The black velvet backdrop had been laid in verse 14. And now the diamond of God's saving grace is placed upon that black velvet backdrop. And it shines brighter than 10,000 suns in the sky above. And I, God is the speaker, will put enmity, conflict, warfare. I will put enmity between you and the woman. God is the preacher, and Satan is the congregation. And God is preaching to the devil. God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. And the woman is Eve. And between your seed and her seed, that tells us that all of human history, there will be only two families... They'll be the children of the devil, and they'll be the children of God. And Satan is the father of all unbelievers. John 8, verse 44, Jesus said, You are of your father the devil, and the lust of him you shall do. And all of those who are of the seed of the woman are the elect of God, are those who have been sovereignly birthed into the kingdom of God, who have been brought into God's family by His initiating sovereign grace. He says all of human history will be the story of this clash and this conflict between darkness and light, between death and life, between hell and heaven, between Satan and God. Notice, He shall bruise you on the head. The he refers to an individual from among the woman's seed, namely, Jesus Christ our Lord, the Redeemer of His elect, the Redeemer of God's people. For you shall call His name Jesus, for He shall save His people from their sins. He shall bruise you referring to bruise Satan on your head, there will literally there will be a, a devastating death blow, a fatal blow that will be rendered at the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
that will literally strike a blow to the kingdom of darkness, that on that cross, Jesus will redeem out of the slave market of sin and darkness those for whom He laid down His life upon the cross. Jesus said in John 12, verse 31, as He moved to the cross and prepared for His death, now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. It's a reference to Satan. Paul would go on to speak of this debilitating blow that Jesus would would bring about upon the head of the serpent. In Colossians 2, verse 14, having canceled out the certificate of debt, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Every sin that you and I have ever committed is written on this certificate of debt. It once was posted upon the prison cell of sin in which we lived in. We were under the wrath of God. The sentence of death had already been declared upon us. The stench of death was in our dying soul. And Jesus upon Calvary's cross, He took that certificate of debt And it was nailed to the cross. And there all of our sins and all of our iniquities and all of our transgressions were nailed to Calvary's cross. And Him who knew no sin, God made to be sin for us. And upon that cross, as He shed His blood in our place, He paid in full the entirety of our sin debt. And if the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. That is what Jesus did upon the cross for us. And it is all prescribed. It is all recorded here in Genesis 3 and verse 15 at the very dawn and at the very front doorsteps of divine revelation. In Hebrews 2 verse 14, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, He Himself, referring to Christ, partook of the same. He became like us so that He could be in our place. He Himself partook of the same so that through death He might render powerless Him who had the power of death. That is the devil. Verse 15, "...and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. That was the conquering triumph that Jesus won upon the cross for us. It is the very heart of our gospel. And it is declared here at the front doorstep of Scripture. At the end of verse 15, and you, referring to Satan, shall bruise him, referring to Christ, the seed of the woman, on the heel. It will be a mere stone bruise on the heel. Compared to the sledgehammer death blow, He will bring about and crush your skull through His death upon the cross. Yes, this gospel was promised long ago. And while you're in Genesis 3, look at verse 21. Here in the Garden of Eden, there was a foreshadowing of this death in the means by which Jesus would crush the head of the serpent at the cross. And in Genesis 3, verse 21, we read, "...the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them." God killed an innocent sacrifice on behalf of the guilty pair, that through the shedding of the blood of this sacrifice, there would be the prefiguring and a prophecy of the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world by His shed blood and by His substitutionary, vicarious, sin-bearing death upon the cross. God had said, in the day that you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die Instead of killing Adam and Eve, God killed an innocent sacrifice. And the shedding of that blood made a picture of the blood that would be shed 
upon Golgotha's cross for us and then clothed them A covering was made for the nakedness, for their nakedness and for their guilt. This too was a foreshadowing of the cross, of the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The very word atonement means a covering. As Jesus shed His blood, it made a perfect covering over our sins such that God in heaven, when He looks down upon sinful human beings like you and me, we are under the blood, and we are covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God does not see our sin anymore, for this, this, this blessed Lamb, the scapegoat of God, has taken our sins far, far away. Our sins God has taken and placed them behind His back. He has buried them in the sea of His forgetfulness. He has said, their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. This clothing pictures the clothing of the perfect righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ that would be imputed to us in the act of forensic justification that we would be covered from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet in the perfect merit and in the perfect obedience and in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. All of this was pictured long ago. This coming Savior prophesied in Genesis 3 and the salvation that He would bring is revealed throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. It was prophesied by the prophets that He would be born of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the seed of Isaac, the seed of David, that He would be born of a virgin, He would be called Emmanuel, He would be born in Bethlehem, He would be adored by great persons after His birth, He would be called out of Egypt, He would be preceded by a forerunner, He would be anointed by the Holy Spirit at the beginning of His ministry, He would be a prophet like Moses, He would be a priest after the order of Melchizedek, He would be commencing His ministry in Galilee, He would come into the temple. He would be marked by meekness and tenderness. He would be without deceit. He would be full of zeal for God. He would preach with parables. He would work miracles. He would bear reproach suffered by the rejection of His brethren. He would be a stone of stumbling to the Jews. He would be hated by the Jews. He would be rejected by the religious Jews and their leaders. He would be betrayed by a friend forsaken by His disciples, sold for 30 pieces of gold, and the money of His betrayal would be given to buy a potter's field. He would be engulfed in suffering, yet suffer for others. He would be patient and silent under suffering. He would be struck on the cheek. He would be marred more than the appearance of a man. He would be spit on and scourged. He would be nailed through His hands and feet. He would be forsaken by God. He would be mocked in His death. He would be offered gall and vinegar. He would be left naked with His garments to be cast lots for. He would be numbered with the transgressors. Yet, He would intercede for His murderers while being put to death. Not a bone would be broken. He would be pierced. He would be buried with a rich man. And yet his flesh would not see corruption because he would be raised from the dead. Every one of those citations have Old Testament Scripture that declare it, that announce it. There is the Gospel according to the Old Testament from Genesis all the way to Malachi. It speaks with one voice of one way of salvation, of one coming Savior who would enter into this world, one diagnosis of the human condition, and only one plan of salvation by which sinners may be saved from the wrath of God. All of this promised in Old Testament Scripture. Turn with me, if you would, for a moment to Acts chapter 3. And the reason I want you to turn to this text, to Acts chapter 3, is I I want you to see that 
the apostolic preaching of the gospel was rooted and grounded in the announcement that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. In fact, it was the starting place for the apostolic preaching of the gospel in the Old Testament. When you take all of the sermons that are recorded in the book of Acts, and by the way, 25% of the entire book of Acts is the quoting of a sermon. The entire book of Acts is virtually one every four verses is a proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The epistles will delineate this gospel and defend this gospel and further define this gospel, but in Acts we see the declaration of this gospel. And we want to preach like the preachers in the book of Acts. The epistles will bring enormous clarity and depth and profundity. But we want to learn from the apostles, do we not? Because their preaching shook the known world. In the apostolic preaching of the gospel, there were five main headings of thought that as you read all of the sermons in the book of Acts, there are five basic foundation stones. And in these sermons, some will have four of the five, some will have three of the five. The one that we are looking at will have all five of the central tenets and main headings of apostolic preaching of the gospel. Let me lay these out for you in Acts chapter 3. And then I want to focus on the first of these five. And there's a, a reason why we're looking at this. In Acts chapter 3, it is Peter's sermon there in Jerusalem as they have gone up to the house of God to pray. And there is a lame man who asks for assistance. And Peter says, Silver and gold I have none, but in the name of Jesus I say to you, arise. And this lame man stood to his feet. The crowd was startled and amazed. And as they gathered around, Paul, excuse me, Peter, Peter used this as a platform to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me draw to your attention the five main headings that just flowed out of his mouth. Number one is Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He begins in verse 13, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified His servant. And he goes on to speak of the, of the prophets in verse 18. He speaks of all of the prophets, what they had announced beforehand, what God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets. And then in verse 21, he says it again, which God spoke by the, mouth of, uh, by the mouth of His holy prophets. And then in verse 24, we see it again, and likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these days. They were looking ahead to the days of the coming of Christ and His death upon the cross for sinners. We'll come back to this. But their preaching is rooted and grounded in this truth that Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament Scripture that was written four, five hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, fourteen hundred years before the coming of Christ. Just a footnote, take Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost and track through and trace the preaching of the Old Testament, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Second is the sinless life of Christ. That is in verse 14. But you disowned the holy and righteous one. This one who died upon this cross, he was the holy and righteous one. He was without sin. He was the only perfect man who ever lived. He was born under the law and by his active obedience, he kept every point of the law. He was blameless. He was flawless. He was without sin. 
And then third, the substitutionary death of Christ. And uh, in verse 15, you put to death the prince of life. This substitutionary death will be more fully developed in other apostolic sermons. But now he makes a declaration, number four, of the bodily resurrection of Christ. At the end of verse 15, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. Again and again and again, the apostles announced and declared the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then fifth and finally, the necessity of repentance and faith. We read in verse 16, on the basis of faith in His name. And by the way, this faith, he will say later in verse 16, comes through Him. Jesus is both the object of faith and He is the source of faith. The faith by which we believe upon Jesus Christ is a faith that in, by His sovereign grace He bestows upon the elect of God and calls them to Himself. In one verse, verse 16, you have, we must have faith in Him with a faith that comes through Him. And then repentance in verse 19. Therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away. These are the terms of the gospel, that you must repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the five headings of gospel presentation in the book of Acts. But I want to return to the first of those headings. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. I want to walk through this just very quickly. And I want us to see how Peter develops this very fully in rich detail. In verse 13, when he says, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified His servant Jesus, Peter is declaring the same message that God declared in the Old Testament is the message that is now being declared in these last days. In verse 18, he says that Christ is the fulfillment of all of the prophets. Verse 18, but the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that His Christ would suffer, He has thus fulfilled. You see, all the prophets, every prophet in the Old Testament was pointing a finger to the future and saying, He is coming, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the Christ, He is coming. In verse 22, we see that He is the fulfillment of Moses' prophets, prophecies. In verse 22, Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. It's a citation or quote from Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15. The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To, to him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. He is the truth. He is the greatest declarer of truth and the greatest revealer of truth who has ever walked this earth. And Moses said, the one who is coming to be the Savior is the one who will announce his own salvation when he comes. Enter through the narrow gate, he said, for the way is broad and the gate is wide that leads to destruction. And many are those who are on it. But the gate is narrow and the way is small that leads to life and few are those who find it. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he who hears these words of mine and acts upon them is like a very wise man who built his house upon the rock. And when the rains came and the winds blew and beat against the house, it did not fall because it was built upon the rock. But he who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them is like a very foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And when the rains came and the winds blew and beat against the house, great was its fall. 
Jesus is the greatest prophet who ever lived. He came and proclaimed His own salvation, which He would secure for us in His death upon the cross. It was Jesus who said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my burden is easy and my load is light. Jesus said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Jesus is this great prophet of whom Moses spoke, who would declare the way of salvation, the very path that he would purchase in his own death. And then in verse 20, 25, we see that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant It is to you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham. And Peter now quotes Genesis 22 and verse 18, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And then in verse 26, Jesus is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecies, specifically His servant song prophecies, as it was mentioned last night, Isaiah 42, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 50, Isaiah 52 and 53, those four servant songs all declare the coming servant of Jehovah who would come and do the work on our behalf and in His finished work upon the cross purchase our salvation. So verse 26, for you first... God raised up His servant. This is a reference to Isaiah's servant prophecies. So what I want us to see in this extended expanding on this is that when Paul says in verse 2 of Romans 1, which he, God, promised beforehand through His prophets in the Holy Scriptures we see that the entire Old Testament Scripture is a presentation of the Gospel that we are now proclaiming in New Testament times. For any man to preach another Gospel, not only is he accursed, but he is broken rank from a long line of godly men. He has broken rank to go off and to preach a message of His own construction that will damn the souls of men, that from the beginning of time when the first couple sinned and the announcement of this salvation, book by book, prophet by prophet, sage by sage, lawgiver to the end, it is the promise of the gospel in the Old Testament. This is the gospel of God. It has been entrusted to us. And it has been committed to our care. Great preachers are gospel preachers. Great preachers preach the full counsel of God. But every line intersects in the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All of our theology every area and every discipline of systematic theology, from prolegomena and theology proper all the way down to our eschatology and every realm and every uh, category of theology, it all comes together and it lifts up the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior of sinners. That is why Paul said, we preach Christ and Him crucified. Paul, you preach the full counsel of God. Paul, you preach every subject. Paul, you preach the height, the depth, the breadth, and the length of the truth of God. And Paul would say, yes, I do. But it all, sta- it, it, it all comes together and standing on this body of divinity is the death of Christ. And I proclaim Him as the apex and as the pinnacle of all truth and all knowledge that has been made known from God to man. Paul said, we proclaim Him. As we are preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, may we recommit ourselves as never before 
to stand for this gospel, to preach this gospel, to teach this gospel, to clarify this gospel, to defend this gospel. May we die preaching this gospel. May this gospel be on our lips. George Whitfield, the great evangelist of yesteryear, perhaps the greatest evangelist who ever lived, said, After I die, bury me under the pulpit. Whitfield died in Newburyport, Massachusetts, many years ago. His last sermon was, Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. He preached the new birth. Except you be born again, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. A woman once came to him and said, Why do you keep preaching you must be born again? Whitfield said, Because, dear woman, you must be born again. He died in the parsonage, the pastor's house next door to the church where he is now buried under the pulpit. He was saved by the gospel. He was called to preach the gospel. He spent his life and energy preaching the gospel. He preached 17,000 sermons in his lifetime. To say nothing of the sermons that he preached after sermons. He crossed the Atlantic Ocean 13 times. He tirelessly gave his life for the gospel. May it be said of us that we were saved by the gospel. We've been called to preach the gospel. May we die in the pulpit preaching the gospel. And after we die, may they take our body and bury it under the pulpit. Because this man preached the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, you have entrusted such riches to mere slaves. How can this be? The very treasure of the gospel has now been deposited into clay pots such as we are. The only beauty about our life is the treasure that we contain in the gospel and how this treasure is even sanctifying us and conforming us into the very image of the one of whom it proclaims the Lord Jesus Christ. May we say with Paul, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I am eager to preach the gospel. I am under obligation to every man everywhere to preach the gospel to him. May your grace be poured out upon us. May you lift up our arms. May you open our mouth. May you revive our hearts. May you kindle a fire upon the altar of our soul. May we be red hot gospel preachers. Father, bless this conference and all that you desire to do in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have an extended break. We will be back in here at 10.30. Dr. John MacArthur will be preaching the very heart of this fourth servant song out of Isaiah 53. You're going to want to be on the edge of your pew and ready to hear this exposition. God bless you. You're dismissed.